my great pleasure to introduce to you my friend Philip Barnes. Um, and I'm also very happy that I was able to convince him to deliver this uh, talk standing because it will be recorded against his habit of sitting when yes. he delivers things, isn't it? I'm yeah. kind of relaxed type of person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you will also be relaxed. I hope so. I, I hope so, yeah. Well, Philip Barnes uh, trained to be a religious education teacher in Strandmillis Millis College in Belfast and then proceeded to study theology and philosophy at Queen's University, Belfast, Northern Ireland, and the University of Hull and Trinity College in Dublin, where he gained also uh, his doctorate in philosophy. He taught religious education in Belfast for 16 years, so he has quite a practice in that and was lecturer in religious education at the University of Ulster before he became reader in religious and theological education at King's, <coughs> King's College in London. He's also been a uh, visiting professor of religious studies at Union Theological College in Belfast. And because of restructurings in King's College, Professor Barnes has been emeritus since 2014, but he's still highly active and um, in researching and publishing, especially in publishing. I envy him a little bit for the freedom and for the time he has now to publish one book after the other. He's well known for having developed an alternative concept of religious education to the long dominant uh, phenomenological approach in, in British multi-faith uh, religious education. I, when I got to know him uh, at one of our first Israel conferences, I remember that he uh, tended to call himself one of the rebels mm -hmm. of uh, religious yeah. <laughs> education uh, theorists in, in Britain. So um, this is also mirrored in his recent authored books titled Edu oh, you wanted to make a, a, actually advertisement for your book uh, yourself, but shall I do it now? Because I reinforce it for the camera. Because I, I <laughs> because I, I, I uh, wanted to mention it. So this is it: uh, uh, education, religion, and diversity from 2014. And there's another book: uh, religious educa no, uh, education. Now, religious education, educating for diversity from 2015. This year he has, uh, together with James Arthur, edited a four-volume selection of important writings by the diverse authors in the thematic field of education and religion, so that might also be important for you or interesting for you as a resource for seminars and, and uh, teaching at university. Alluding to the British concept of multi-faith religious education and its difference from the German context, concept of theologically grounded confessional religious education, I have invited Professor Barnes to reflect in his paper on the question of public theologies or religious studies, deliberations on the basis of multi-faith religious education. De Philip, I'm looking forward to your certainly stimulating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manfred, for the, that very warm welcome. Uh, what Manfred omitted to say is that in the collection of essays that I edited, Manfred, of course, he talked about influential religious educators being included in that, of which he is one, by the way. I'm going to read two quotations to begin with. And when I read them, you can think who could have said this. Here we go. I find it impossible to hold that the consequences of modern studies and, and of views relating to my own would be to change theology faculties into faculties for the study of the history of religions. Faculties of this kind would be utterly meaningless. What theology is concerned with is not the history of religion in general, but normative knowledge acquired through the scientific knowledge of religion. Only this can have meaning for theology. This one thing is not one of many tumora, like possibilities, that hover far off in the distance. It is within reach. It leads naturally in the direction of Christianity. What is important, therefore, in the first place, is to derive this normativeness from the history of religion 
instead of from scholastic theories of revelation or apologetics. Same writer, second quotation. To build up a theological faculty with no official knowledge of normative religious truth uh, and believe that one has to hunt for it like an explorer for the North Pole or a water witcher for water would be a manifest absurdity. For religion has no meaning and indeed ceases to be religion if its truth and content are treated as something distant and supposedly quite unknown, if it is regarded as a source of eternally debatable problems rather than actually given divine actions and power. I don't know if I want to ask the question, does anyone know who that's taken from? German, very famous German theologian, by the way, Ernst Trilch, uh, at, at the turn of the 20th century, where he was contrasting essentially uh, theology, which he associates with providing normative truth, and with the discipline of the emerging discipline then of the study of academic study of religion or the history of religion or whatever title we want to give, we might now call it religious studies, and he associates that with eternally looking for answers, non-normative position. So here we have theology with its normative commitments and in his view religious studies without any normative commitments. Now I hope you can see the, the relevance of that to, to what I'm going to say because it's a popular image that theology is partisan, normative and so on whereas religious studies is objective and neutral and all of those other positive things. Of course we could say more about Trilch because he uh, there are complications even in what I said because even though he was critical of the study of the history of religion he also believed that he could derive normative truth from religion that pointed in the direction of Christianity. So there's a kind of challenge there as well. I hope that my listeners will appreciate the relevance of these two quotations and the distinctions that are made in them to the theme of this paper which in broad terms concerns the relationship between religious education, religious studies, and theology. Theology provides a normative set of beliefs which supports a distinctive form of life. That's his view, Trilch. Yet, the historical study of religion, or religious studies, according to Trilch, operates, and I quote, with no official knowledge. It is forever, again, I quote, exploring. To which should religious education relate, and in what ways? For we must raise the critical question whether Trulch has co correctly captured and articulated the difference between theology and religious studies. Is it the case? Is that the, dis the distinction that should be uh, drawn between the two, one a discipline, the other a field of study? The relevant disciplines of theology and religious studies uh, and one traditional way of distinguishing them has been introduced. The critical question and the question to be explored in this paper is how these disciplines and categories relate to the study of religion in schools. The perspective that is brought to my discussion is one derived from history, uh, particularly derived from the history of British religious education and critical reflection upon that history. There's no uh, neutral account of history. We're, we're quite aware of that. And mine is not neutral either. It is, of course, the correct account. Uh, <laughs> if, it, if it wasn't the correct account, I wouldn't be here telling you about it. I would tell you a different story. Every author believes, in a sense, that what he says is true. I'm no exception. Um, it will be a brief and necessarily superficial account. And in fact, I have much uh, I have too much material to get through, so I'm going to uh, summarize it, uh, but sufficiently, I hope, to give you a flavor of uh, some of the developments within, within British religious education, particularly the shift from confessional education to non-confessional, multi-faith religious education. Now, I'm not going to defend the principle of multi-faith religious education. I'm going to take it that I support multi-faith religious education. Of course, it can mean different things. And if someone wants to ask me, what, what form do I think it should take? 
uh, I can re respond to that, but that's not my purpose at present. In other words, I'm assuming at its lowest level that pupils should study a range of religions. It may, not equally, perhaps, but different proportions in different contexts, but I'm assuming that. Um, now, first section is entitled From Confessionalism to Non-Confessionalism in British Religious Education. This, uh, the story that I'm about to retell is familiar to many, and its details need not detain us. What is important for our purposes is to identify the terms and nature of the debate in which the transition from, the, from confessionalism to non-confessionalism occurred in the historical context of Britain. Now, context is crucially important. We know this. So, in a sense, uh, even though this is a... a this section I'm going to gloss over very quickly. Nevertheless, it's an important section because it justifies some of the conclusions that I reach. And it's also true in a, working with a different audience. Some of you will come from a different context that maybe some of the terms that I use may have a slightly different meaning in your own environment rather than mine. So it's, uh, let, let, let's hope uh, I'm sufficiently clear uh, in what I say. The account that I give is, is developed more fully in this book. Uh, I'll hold it up to the camera. Um, uh, so if someone kind of thinks, well, that sounds superficial or I'm not sure about that, this is where I would say the evidence is. So it's developed at greater length. The reason I say this is that my interpretation of British religious education is not at all popular. It is not the standard account. The standard story is one of success evolution, natural development, progress, rationality, winning through. That's not the, the picture that I tell or the narrative that I construct in this book. In fact, chapter two, I think, is called The Rhetoric of Success and the Reality of Underachievement. So, uh, right. Uh, in Secular Education and the Logic of Religion, published in 1968, Professor Ninian Smart um, the, then head of the first department of religious studies in a British university. Uh, in this book, <clears throat> he said, or he identified, he said, there, they, there is, uh, he identified schizophrenia, divided mind of modern British religious education. Now, he meant confessional religious education. Here's what he says. The schizophrenia consists in the two facts that Christian education is entrenched in our school system and that the typical modern institution of higher education is secular, that is, neutralist in regard to religious or ideological commitments. Neutralism is in part a reflection of the plural society in which we live. Ours is a society where only a minority is firmly wedded to orthodox Christian belief and practice. He continues, it is odd that an open and religiously uncommitted society should yet attempt in its schools to purvey some form of faith. Um, in other words, he is arguing that, and he then looks to the discipline of religious studies to provide, to provide a new direction for religious education in Britain. Uh, and he presents that direction as a neutral, objective <coughs> direction. In other words, theology, again, uh, is partisan. It holds to normative commitments that can't be expressed in public schools, and therefore, Christian confessionalism uh, should not obtain in public schools. Uh, interestingly, in that book, he also drew a distinction between the historical claims of religion and parahistorical claims. Uh, and para-historical claims were the, uh, not just a description of religion, but that young people need to acquire the skills to evaluate and assess religion. And that was an important uh, point. However, it subsequently was modified. A few years later, uh, Ninian Smart was uh, appointed as uh, the lead investigator of a school's project and they produced a document, a very influential document, called Working Paper 36, 
in which he charted a new course, non-confessional course for religious education. And in it, he hadn't done it originally in uh, secular education and the logic of religion. In this working paper, he looked to the phenomenological approach and the continental tradition of the phenomenological study of religion for inspiration. So he said, here is an objective, neutral way of studying religion, and that's the way religion should be studied in all schools. And uh, he also, within that, uh, actually, he moved away from his critical approach, the inclusion of a critical approach, because he said, under the influence of phenomenology, we should uh, bracket our presuppositions, and we should try to enter into the experience of religious people as they have religious experience. In other words, to understand a religious phenomenon, we need to put ourselves in, in their place. And he also, interestingly, thought if we could do that, we also will develop empathy. So the phenomenological method was objective. We, we try to put ourselves in the position of the religious believer and experience the event through their eyes. And at the same time in doing that, we acquire the, um, an attitude of empathy towards other people. Now, you can see the attraction of that. That should be obvious. Um, now, that's skipping over. So, in, in a sense, there, there was both an objective element, and within that objective element was a, an element that would challenge religious bigotry and intolerance, this particular methodology. Uh, after SMART, th this approach was taken up by a number of very significant religious educators and translated into the idiom of education. And sometimes even the actual terminology was used. They looked to people like uh, Rudolf Otto, van der Leeuwen, uh, Christiansen, uh, a whole range of phenomena, uh, Eliade in America. These are the people that they look to for inspiration. Uh, here's one representative quotation from a prominent religious educator. Here's what he says. Uh, and this is meant to be for year 10 pupils in secondary school. Religion, for all of its forms and manifestations, is something basic and essential to what is human. The attempt to express this verbally also will, or at least ought to, emphasize that most of these forms are non-verbal. If you're a philosopher, you should Become, become critical, non-verbal forms of experience. Interesting. I'm not sure if I've had those, uh, or at least that I can't express them verbally. They are wordless because they are too deep, arising from the depths of the human and divine encounter. <coughs> and this is an objective study of religion within the phenomenology, phenomenological approach, divine encounter. Even within the allegiance to one faith, there are countless forms and expressions. And yet what gleams through the differences is precisely the unity of mankind, we should read humankind, <coughs> in our primal destiny and our relation to God. In practice, students have quite spontaneously declared that an understanding and respect for the religions of other men and women, I would add, has deepened and clarified their personal faith within their own religious traditions. Now, who can tell me that's not theological? That's the point I'm wanting to say. That was the one particularly prominent uh, academic approach to the study of religion, derived from mainly continental writers, translated into education, that was presented and neutral and objective. All right. These standard commitments, so phenomenological religious education in Britain, if you look at the material uh, that was to guide uh, the beliefs and values and the way in which teachers should teach. Uh, it claims to be multi-faith, inclusive, neutral, and objective. No religion is privileged over any other. Why not? Because, of course, the theory has it that every religion initiates an encounter with the sacred or the holy. Of course, it, it may mean that some articulate that experience better than others. That would have been the position, I suppose, of uh, certainly Rudolf Otto. Uh, religious education has now acquired a place on the curriculum on the basis of it being objective and neutral, we are told. And the subject is concerned 
with the presumed sui generis category of religion. So religion is a kind of unique category. And therefore, because it's a unique category, it deserves a place on the curriculum. Solved. We now have a place for religion in the curriculum, and so on. Uh, formally, the critical evaluation of religious beliefs and practices can be set aside, bracketed out, as the phenomenology of religion's methodology demands, yet informally, the truth of religion is assumed. Now, anyone who is familiar with the history of modern thought uh, should recognize the indebtedness of the phenomenological form of religious studies to liberal post-Enlightenment Protestant theology. Uh, as most historians of religious studies now point out, the phenomenology of religion is one important stream of development within liberal Christian thought, a point that's stressed now by some of the commentators on the development of religious studies as a discipline. Now, where does it come from? The perceived collapse of natural theology in response to the criticism of Hume, and more significantly Kant, convinced many that the path from public and demonstrable knowledge to God was at best inconclusive and at worst intellectually bankrupt. In response, following Schleiermacher, theology turned inward to the experience of the divine within the self. In a sense, this move aped or <coughs> copied the Cartesian foundationalist quest for inner epistemic certainty. Schleiermacher extended the range of justifying experiences to include religious experiences. The heart of religion was relocated in the pre-reflective experiential depths of the self, and the public or outer features of religion came to be regarded as expressive and evocative objectifications or non-discursive symbols of internal experience. That's from the American theologian George Lindbeck. That's who he characterized liberal theology of that period. The romantic appeal to religious experience initiated by Schleiermacher set the pattern for modern, modern theology. So there's an appeal to inner subjectivity. Uh, and in, in a sense, a, a lively faith is compatible with a thoroughgoing skepticism uh, towards the historical, moral, and philo philosophical aspects of religious belief. Effectively, religion is rem removed from the realm of public knowledge and the realm of the sacred secularized. The result is that public knowledge becomes equivalent to secular knowledge. So religion has retreated to within the self, a genuine encounter with the divine within the self. And we can be skeptical uh, Therefore, we can use historical criticism, we can discover all kinds of things, but the heart of the religion remains pure within the self. That, that's uh, my reading of modern theology, controversial as it is. Now, uh, this, these are the commitments that were taken on within British religious education. And in my book, I have a, uh, quite a number of quotations of people who kind of express these commitments. The idea that a religious experience cannot be expressed, that it is ineffable, which is the same thing, uh, that it's uh, a unique category of, of reality and experience, uh, and that the religions can be reconciled to each other at the experiential level. And at, this, at an outer level, they can have different interpretations of the divine, all of this. Uh, and in a sense, this was meant also to, to challenge bigotry and intolerance, because you can see the logic here. Uh, this time, the, what you perceive as the other, the person from the other religious tradition, at heart shares a deeper spiritual unity with you. Uh, I'm quite critical of that. But, uh, <coughs> We're now aware, uh, and there's been a big debate in religious studies that we could talk about in the last uh, 10, 15 years, that these theorists, uh, particularly Otto, Ninian, Smart, and others, are now labeled religionist or crypto-theologians. Uh, and we might want to say something more about that debate, but I need to press on. Now, so here we have a situation where religious studies is looked to for inspiration, and it's presented as being neutral. But when we look at the presumed neutrality, it actually has definite religious commitments. It's, they're not Christian confessional commitments. 
It's confessionalism of a more liberal, universal, ecumenical form, but commitments nevertheless. Now, jumping forward to 2014, and I think I, I, I'll not read any of this. It would be better to read it and make more sense, but I think I have too much to go through. So there are two writers uh, called Denise Cush and Catherine Robinson, and they construct a narrative where they say, uh, in this article, that religious studies provided the inspiration for non-confessional religious education. Now there's less influence from religious studies and the, the, the field of religious education has lost its direction and we need to uh, re-establish a dialogue with religious studies in order to reinvigorate religious education. They then look to different streams of thought within religious studies and say these should be incorporated into religious education. Now, there are a number of things going on, but if one looks closely at all their suggestions and they draw on different forms of, uh, of theoretical commitments, uh, most of what they say really indicates that for them, religious education uh, is not effective in challenging bigotry and intolerance, and in furthering the moral and social development of pupils. And the irony, of course, is that the origin of this lies in the phenomenology of religion. Again, if we go back to Schleiermacher, remember how he distinguished between the religious, uh, experiential religion, but religion was not concerned with pure reason, nor was it concerned with morality. So within the phenomenological tradition, there's a divorce of religion from morality. We can trace this through. And actually in British religious education, in working paper 36, it says religion is an entirely different subject from morality. And religious educators should focus on religion and not on developing morality. Interesting, again, there's that influence coming through. So the irony is, in this case, uh, Cush and Robinson look to religious studies to invigorate <coughs> the subject of religious education, but fail to appreciate that it's the influence of religious studies that created the problem in the first place. They were uncritical in their interaction with religious uh, studies. Uh, but they did implicitly identify the weakness that religious education has become divorced from moral education, and they talk about remoralizing religious education. Now, again, to, to, to paraphrase or, or to, to summarize, essentially what I'm now saying is that we had a presentation by some and the perception by others that theology is partisan, normative, Religious studies is non-partisan, open, objective, neutral. I have challenged that distinction. And of course, it is on the basis of that distinction that when Cush and Robinson look for inspiration, they never look to theology. Because, of course, theology is regarded as indoctrinatory, partisan, etc. Because they're continuing that, what you might say, perception of their nature. Now, we would, what I have done is attempted to show that religious studies is anything but objective and neutral. It too has commitments and certainly in the, uh, the form of the phenomenology of religion it had definite liberal Protestant commitments. Now, there's lots more that could be said. Uh, but I also would want to just interject at this stage at present in religious studies, there, there is no ruling paradigm. There is no one grand theory there wa the way there was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and I'll say something more. Uh, maybe I should actually read that bit out for formally, if I can find it. Uh, yes. Uh, currently, there are, there, are oh, well, there are different currents of thought in religious studies and different forms and varieties of normative thought that influence religious studies and are expressed through religious studies. On almost every issue there is debate and argument where different normative commitments interact and sometimes clash. For example, on the nature of religion, on the methodology best suited to interpreting religion, and on the social and political stance 
of the scholar of religion. So there's debate within religious studies, there are ideological commitments, but there's no longer a ruling model that they all adhere to. So there's diversity. So there are still commitments, there are still normative positions, but you can choose which one to follow. Now, is that the end of my argument? Have I simply shown that religious studies does have commitments just like theology? And in that regard, they're both alike. So therefore, um, we might say, uh, let's, let's draw upon theology alongside religious studies because they both have commitments. Is that the end of the argument? I'm checking the time, for it's not. It's more complicated than that. And here's, here's why I think it's complicated. Um, just wait till I see. It may be assumed that the aim of my argument is to reinstate a role for theology in religious education, which it is, and it's now been accomplished by showing that both theology and religious studies include normative commitments and make normative claims. Okay. Uh, of course, we need to, as Wittgenstein would say, we need to look and see and examine and be critical about the normative claims that religious studies has or religious studies make and theology makes. It's more complicated than that, and here's why it's complicated. Generally, we could say that theology has normative commitments uh, that relate to Christian faith and practice. So, to, to speak as a Christian theologian, one believes in certain things about Christ, about God, etc. And there should be some sense of uh, what you might say, those commitments would be common, or one, they should ideally be common, even though there's differences of interpretation. Whereas in religious studies, at present, there are normative commitments, there are all kinds of commitments, but scholars are free to choose any option, any way they want to. I mean, I have, I have actually said, a range of ideological positions and commitments are evident. Feminism, gay rights and transgender activism, structuralism, neo-Marxism, and so I could go on. All of these are present within religious studies. So there are normative commitments, but you're not required to, you know, it's not impressed on you which one you have to follow. Where Christian theology, there are certain beliefs and commitments that are kind of common to Christians. So there's a difference in the, in the you might say, the character of the normal, uh, of, the, uh, of the commitments. What role then for theology? Um, my first comment will not address, address this directly, uh, but it is an important implication that follows for religious education from recognition of the normative claims of Christianity and Christian theology. Uh, if Christianity makes normative claims, then I believe that introduces the need in any form of religious education for a critical approach, going back to Smart's idea that young people should, have the, uh, should be provided with the knowledge and the skills to assess and evaluate religious um, Christianity for themselves or any other religions. We live in a pluralist world, uh, and I, I say this, uh, I could say it more formally, but in a pluralist world where increasingly people have to choose what to believe, they can contribute to the making of their own identities. Uh, and because of this, there needs to be a critical element in all forms of religious education, because choice is a necessary feature of our modern, secular, Western, liberal societies. Uh, of course, choice is also within the Christian tradition. Uh, it, it, I mean, it, the stance of allowing choice is consistent with Christian commitment. Uh, for religious faith to be genuine, it must be freely chosen. Uh, uh, in the land of the Reformation, I do not need to remind my hearers of, of the importance attached by Luther to the concept of religious liberty understood by him as the, as the need to commit oneself individually and existentially to the cause of Christ. So freedom is compatible with Christian faith. We shouldn't be frightened of, of freedom. Now, in speaking of the critical element uh, of religious education, it necessarily raises the issue of Christian beliefs. Now, there's another section that I'm just going to paraphrase, which is, here's the conclusion. Beliefs are constitutive of religion and of religious experience. So, yeah. uh, I do not intend to justify the view. I think it can be justified chiefly by reference to the philosophy of the later Wittgenstein. Uh, 
in other words, what I'm saying is what makes uh, an experience religious is the use of religious concepts. If there's no use for religious concepts, then it's not a religious experience. It could be controversial, I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> but if you're not using the language of religion, in what sense is it religious? So I'm saying uh, the, the very, so belief is essential to understanding a religion. And if belief is essential to understanding a religion, then theology has a role to play in religious education. Because it's the theologian who can clarify the nature of uh, the beliefs of Christianity. Uh, I mean, if someone, to give an example, you cannot understand the Christian idea of forgiveness without having an understanding of, of God, sacrifice, repentance, and the rules that govern how these beliefs relate to each other. Uh, again, if I had time, I would like to say something about uh, Wittgenstein's remark, theology is grammar where theology provides the rules of how the different Christian concepts fit together. So I'm saying if we're going to teach Christianity, we have got to include its beliefs. If we include its beliefs, we have got to uh, receive inspiration from theologians to correct us and to, to show us how the beliefs fit together. Secondly, theology has a role to play in assisting religious education to realize the, the, so, the moral and social aims of education. Christianity and theology has the ability to reconnect theology and morality. Uh, how is that? Remember that uh, Hume's problem was how, how do we get... Uh, the, the, well, his problem was the dichotomy between facts and values. And that's what lay behind working <clears throat> paper 36. Uh, however, for Christians, morality and beliefs are intrinsically connected. Christian moral imperatives are grounded in Christian indicatives. As Eberhard Jungel has said, the indicative carries the imperative. Simple terms, Paul says, you are a new being in Christ, then he goes to the ethical content. On the basis of your new being, your new creation in Christ, your behavior should be like this. It's grounded in something that has happened to the individual. The is moves to the ought. Uh, the problem of Hume, of course, how to derive an ought from an is, it's not a problem for Christians because all facts exist in an ontologically prior universe that was created, sustained, and will be brought to its proper end, tell us, by an essentially good God. All facts are value laden. Coming on to my conclusion very soon. So, Theology also has a role in developing resources and materials to challenge bigotry and intolerance and develop respect for others. There's lots of material in, in the, the Christian tradition and the Christian scriptures that can be used in a school situation. Uh, again, we've talked about rights. Uh, I think young people should be aware of within the Christian tradition there is a justification for rights. Uh, recently argued by Nicholas Wolterstorff. Uh, and he has said that the doctrine of God's image in man provides the best foundation for assertion of human rights. Um, but there's lots of other material. You know, uh, Christ's teaching about who is my neighbor. Uh, we should treat others as we would like to be treated. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Again, these are theological stories. Finally, there is uh, much within the domain of public theology that is relevant to educators and to religious education. If we think of public theology as theology that self-consciously aims to engage with and contribute constructively both to the civil, social and political interests of society and to the common good, then clearly theologians are required to reflect upon and articulate a theology of education for different contexts confessional and otherwise. Christianity has important things to say about education and has to join in the public debate about the church's service to the community in terms of its contribution to both personal and civic virtue. Equally, public theology provides material for religious education through its reflections and statements. For public theology articulates the social conscience of the church as it relates to such important matters as justice and peace. I hope I have been successful in showing that theology, like religious studies, has relevance for religious education in schools. 
I have said little specifically about public theology as an aspect of the wider subject of theology, but per perhaps by showing that theology uh, has educational relevance, perhaps this can be construed and interpreted as a contribution and expression to public theology. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. As always, stimulating, challenging, the floor is open. We have about 17, 18 minutes for our discussion. Liam. Just to say, yeah, Philip, I, mean, I agree with you, as you know, with a lot of, uh, of your work and uh, uh, that, that, uh, the paradigms and so forth. Of course, I, I was educated, uh, well, I was taught by Indian Smart, uh, <coughs> and I spent many years in that department. Uh, in Lancaster back in the 80s. Um, it was kind of a very rich uh, experience. And in practice, what happened at Lancaster is that it wasn't the same strict... I know the school's issue becomes different. But in, in the department of Lancaster, uh, there was really not such a strict division between the, 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 the phenomenological, the sociological, the anthropological, psychological study of religion, which I think Ninian Smart would understand the phenomenological, would incorporate those range of disciplines, but also theology, because I mean there were theologians and biblical scholars within that department, and I think Ninian Smart's vision um, would have incorporated there. My question, very quickly though, is, and you brought up, since you brought up the Reformation, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I felt I had to. Since, since, uh, <laughs> since you brought up the Reformation, my question would be, perhaps be an obvious one is, if you're talking about theology as a, as a sort of framework, I mean, the obvious question is, what theology? Or, I mean, whose theology? Mm. You know, especially since, you know, we've got the Reformation. Context. I don't think it's as easy, perhaps, mm. and I think that, that side could be more nuanced mm. when you're examining yeah. the question about Whose theology? I mean, even if you look at Protestant tradition, of course, that's very diverse. Even Catholic tradition, with its central authority and so forth, is itself, you know, has been historically and contemporary terms rife with. So the question is about uh, whose theology or what theology? Yeah. Uh, I, I, in the actual paper itself, I devote a little bit more time than I did expressing it here, but it's a, it's a legitimate question and a valid question, whose theology, and, and who, speaks, who speaks for theology as well. Uh, I think basically the, the quick answer is, I think when we represent uh, religions uh, in, in an educational context, we should represent, we should be an, as inclusive as we can of different religious traditions and interpretations. Now that also needs to be kind of developed uh, and what one means by that and what's included and what's excluded. But I'm taking it for granted that any Christian, uh, any presentation of Christianity that, for example, doesn't attach significance, ultimate significance to Jesus Christ, uh, if it doesn't believe in the existence of God, if it bypasses any notion of sacrifice or repentance or forgiveness, that those are, those are not faithful representations of the Christian tradition. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Philip. I, I maybe uh, connect to, to the question from Liam. In, in the end, it's all a question of in institutional power. So actually, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not clear at all um, whose theology it is in the sense of who is doing the teacher's training. Where, where are the people that educated you are speaking of? So are we speaking of theologians in the sense of people that have been educated in kind of faculties of theology, um, uh, or from the department, can, can people that have been educated in the Department of Religious Studies, could they, in your opinion, uh, do something like theology? Um, what's the role of the churches in all this dynamic situation? So, and, and also, I mean, as far as I'm, I, I see it, <coughs> um, theology as a label, so to say, is in, in, in the Anglo-Saxon context, still um, kind of connected or associated with something like, um, well, what do you call that? The church uh, interest into um, 
bringing certain dogmatic aspects into uh, religious education. So I, I actually I wonder about the, yeah. the the complexity of the institutional yeah. side behind what you explained. I, I think there are complexities that are contextual, and uh, I maybe haven't done justice sufficiently to the complexities of the context. Uh, what I really want was wanting to show uh, and, and to challenge is that since about the 1970s, uh, theology has been excluded as a partner for religious education in schools. Uh, it's regarded as partisan, it's, they're all so for some of the reasons that I have presented. And what I'm arguing uh, and saying is that theology can be and, and quite deserves to be a partner within religious education. And religious educators who exclude theology from their consideration uh, are, are doing so uh, on an inappropriate basis. So really, I'm, I'm wanting to say, of course, there's a role for religious studies uh, and the insights that they have about religion. But there's also a role for the theologian uh, and to, to be aware of kind of the connections between beliefs and values and all of those things that we shouldn't, religious educators shouldn't look askance uh, at theology and its contribution, theology can contribute something. I mean, ironically, Ninian Smart said that uh, to involve theology in religious education, it was essentially indoctrinatory, and it's that that I'm challenging. So, just, um, I'm not quite satisfied with that. So, the, 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 the question to me is where will and who is responsible for teaching the religious educators in doing theology. Okay. How does theology, in an institutional sense, comes into back into the business? <clears throat> Which are the places? Okay. Uh, if I answer that in a descriptive way, theology is not included in the preparation for most religious education teachers. It is excluded. Uh, it's also true the postgraduate course at King's, with which I was involved for training teachers, uh, most of the students who came along to become religious education teachers did not have a theological background. A few did. Now, of course, you don't have to have a degree in theology to theologize. But there, there, was, there is that tradition in Britain that theology is an inappropriate subject for reflection and for providing insect, insight. Uh, for the practice of religious education, and it's that I want to challenge. And you, you can't do uh, an MA in religious education when you've done a BA in theology? Oh no, you could, yes, you could. yes, you could. That's what I have yeah. in mind. Yeah, well, you, could, you could do that. Okay, first, um, I really want to thank you for this very stimulating um, uh, thoughts you presented us. Thank you. Um, and I actually wholeheartedly agree that religious studies are uh, not neutral or yeah. objective. And um, I really like your term crypto theologians, yeah. because that's quite often what happens. Um, I heard the term now in a different context, mm -hmm. but I would um, suggest that the difference between religious studies and theology is the, the way they are using the term of religion. Mm -hmm. And religious study, uh, theology, as you mentioned yeah. uh, quite often, uh, is normative, yeah. or is a normative use of religion, and uh, religious studies are using a descriptive, yeah. uh, <coughs> using religion. But apart from that, yeah. lots and lots and lots of it is yeah. the same. What they are doing, the methodology and, and the objectives, what yeah. they're trying to do. But the use of the term religion is it is a crucial difference, difference yeah? yeah. I have to reflect further yeah. on that. Yeah. As far as I yeah. um, okay. we can see that. And I also, I really uh, support what you said about um, the lack of theology within the religious educational mm -hmm. process. As you said, it's became a pariah, actually. Yeah. 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 And uh, this is my personal experience uh, within lots of uh, talks with uh, people from especially the British Isles, but also from the Nordic countries, uh, yeah, that actually. basically theology is a boo, no go, bad word. No, yeah. we don't do that. Uh, we do proper Yes, stuff. proper and the I'm, serious I'm, I'm exaggerating now. But basically uh, to bring forward a theological argument in a specific case is virtually impossible. And uh, from that point of view, um, 
I think what you what you mentioned um, with um, RE needs some normative elements from contributed by theology. Uh, I think it's vital because if you don't understand why something is argued in a certain way and why it should be that way, it's difficult to actually understand why this has found a solution in a different context. Yes. And um, I mean, we, we've had the possibility to already see quite a few lessons um, in um, countries where they do um, sort of religious uh, studies, mm -hmm. um, 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 RE um, systems. Uh, but I haven't quite found out what happens if one of the pupils would say, so, now tell me, what, what do you believe in? What do you stand for? How does that work? And I have not found out. I hope we will uh, find out in, in, in the context of our uh, research project. But I haven't found out how that works. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was informative and illuminating. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had a question um, after... You come from a multi-faith religious education, or the idea um, lived in, in Great Britain. And we have the more denominational-based uh, mm -hmm. uh, religious education. Would you, if you say theology, would have been more um, part of the religious education in your country? Prefer a denominational or more denominational uh, religious education, or would you stick to it? I actually think the distinction is not a principled one. It's a pragmatic one. In other words, if we have schools that are open, that are intended to be open to those of different beliefs and traditions and convictions, then I think that the religious education, the nature of it, should not commend one religion over another. It's a pragmatic thing. If, however, one has a Christian school uh, which intends to encourage and nurture Christian faith and is advertised as such, then I think it is quite legitimate educationally for it to do so. In saying that, the difference between the two forms of religious education may not be all that different, because even in a confessional context, as I've tried to say, there needs to be a role for criticism. We need to take on board that young people, uh, we can't assume that they have uh, religious commitments, even though they may have the label of belonging to a Christian tradition. They may be just, there may be as many agnostics there in the classroom as there are in non-religious schools. So that has to be taken account of even in confessional schools. So the difference is not something that one's indoctrinatory and the other is not. One's open and the other is closed. Actually, in a British context, if, uh, uh, I looked through the literature and subsequent to the introduction of multi-faith religious education, Religious educators in Britain began to describe themselves as professionals and those who worked in a faith context were implicitly non-professional. Now there's a whole story there as well, isn't there? And of course someone, as I think was Thomas has mentioned, the notion of power is here as well. Let's not fool ourselves. Uh, the, the church has an influence in education uh, for all kinds of reasons, some not all that Christian. and. There are secular uh, claims to power as well. There's a lot of things going on here, and, and, and my, my presentation, I'm sure, was not nearly nuanced enough to capture all of those. The, maybe the written paper is a little better, maybe not that much. I'm referring to your uh, perception of theology. Yes. And um, I was wondering if, if uh, there might be that. that there are more differences um, to, to get into the reflection. If you have a look at the exegetical research, mm -hmm. there is, uh, in, in my point of view, there is not so much commitment to dogmatics. Uh, the, the international um, discussion on exegetical problems is, in, in my view, more uh, independent from uh, a confessional perspective. Okay. So there, there are some differences if you have a look at the at the five different disciplines uh, yeah. uh, uh, within theology. Yeah. There, there's a lot of diversity within yeah. theology. I grant all of this. This is, this is uh, in, in a sense, this is something I know. But it's also true to say 
that uh, what I have said is that in representing Christianity in the classroom to pupils at different aptitudes and at different ages, I think we should try to present as inclusive a view of, as Christianity as we can. So therefore, if someone says, oh, there's a liberation perspective here or a gay perspective you're not including, I would want to be as wide as I can, but nevertheless within the bounds of Christian orthodoxy. As they get older, they, I think they should be open more to diversity within theology. No one denies that. Uh, but whether we want to expose four or five-year-olds to some of these trends or to let them know that there are differences of opinion among biblical scholars, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I probably wouldn't do that, though I would be aware of it. So in that sense, uh, uh, again, uh, the, the examples I used, if I talk about Christianity, I think I would want to talk about God. I would want to talk about forgiveness. I would want to talk about Christ. And if someone said in their presentation of Christianity, oh, I, I don't, Chris, Christ doesn't come into it, I would say, are we talking about Christianity at all here? Or are we talking about something else? I mean, I would want, I mean, surely it is that as you progress in age and aptitude, so you become more cognizant of difference and diversity. But maybe I wouldn't introduce diversity to, to young children or whatever. I would have to give a, a picture that fitted in with their psychological development and understanding. But by the time they get to 15, 13, 14, 15, 16, of course they're going to be aware of diversity within society. It's all around them, even Christian diversity. And those are issues that should be aired and discussed in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are two more people on the list. I suggest we take you two together, because time is running out. Okay, uh, okay thank you very much. Uh, I come from Sweden. We have a very parallel history of RE that, that mm -hmm. Britain has, and, and this multi-faith subject that is based on religious uh, studies very much. Uh, and uh, I think it's interest. I think a dichotomy is created a bit too much here between religious studies mm -hmm. and theology. Because of course, I mean, I train teachers of religious education from a religious studies perspective. Of course, they they read you know things from theology. Of course, that is part of, of it uh, in the religious uh, studies approach. And also in terms of the subject. I mean, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article for Temenos about the Swedish uh, religion education subject, which is, uh, the title is Objective and Neutral or Marinated in uh, liber uh, Protestant Theology. You know, yeah. where it's, <laughs> where I question... I hope you agree with me. The, the question, I, I therefore, um, so I question that, that people always call the, the Swedish subject neutral. Okay. But I still think it should be based on the comparative study of religions, where, of course, studies of theologies mm -hmm. come in. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't expect, think, yeah. you know, I don't really recognize this very strong dichotomy that yeah. you're putting up between yeah. the... Uh, the well, what I'm doing is I'm professing to find that dichotomy in the literature, yeah. and it, that it has exerted historical influence. Mm -hmm. I also would like to say that this, you know, the relation between religious studies and theology is very, very different in different countries. Yeah, I, I find that when, you know, I come to, you know, it's like hitting you that, that oh, you're, you're suddenly in the context that, that these two fight, and you're then in, in, in a context where, you know, they mostly agree, but they are different. One is descriptive and, uh, and one is more yeah. normative. It's not that big, big thing. So, so I just wanted to comment on that, that I think that there's, this dichotomy is, is maybe not always that thing. Leave it with a comment. Yeah. <laughs> well, religious education is always contextual. Yeah. Bruce, you have the last I'll pass yeah. because that last statement you made about context and what Jenny yeah. said basically captures what I was interested okay. in as well. So I <laughs> Thank you. You're very lucky because it's <laughs> already now to finish almost on time. Uh, thanking you again for this wonderful presentation.